Aleluia 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 for a minute let's see if we can take a teaching today it's not looking like it but let's see Ay, 
Jala libra da casada libre de que libra do con sonto lubre que está allí vaga y el 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 libra de un sonto lubra casa y que de casa libra casa que está allí vaga da do 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 va anda libra a calibra de casa de le mano do 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 con sonto libra de casi casi da libra do de casa libra do sonto casa li calibra da casa que de vaga da do con sonto que se de casa da libra y que te lleva do yo con Yo yo praga su kaka ta yi maga da kata ye gele ka ye le 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 i ala pruka su kada na ma hando kata kata kala praga sa kata ma hando le 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 ka ye ye yo no no gele ba ku sa kata ye gele le 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 ka li bravo ka tu ma ga ga le ka li le 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 ka la ba du ka ba ba le ka ba ba hando ka ye ma ka yu ga ka ye ke le ke le ka Libra kasundo, kile magashi na liba handa liba deke deke deke, kasu kaliba la handa liba kada doko to, kacheke kada dale, kaya magashi na liba deke deke kada doko. Iya 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 yo 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 yo, kala bratsu to ye, kala maga kaka ya, kaya pato, kema dudo, kema kana, kima na ma, kala mago soko to ko to ko to ko. Sakada batu sete le magana kado do. Breke teke yema do sakanda. Thank you Jesus. 
thank you Jesus 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 thank you 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 Jesus
try one more time. We worship you in Jesus' name. Last week we looked at the journey, part 12, and we looked at the warfare. Hallelujah. We were reminded that the moment we said yes to Jesus, the devil blacklisted us. Therefore, we have an enemy, and his ministry is threefold. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. So every time you step out, that's like this massive bull's um, target point on your back. And the enemy can strike at any time. What that means is that, as the scripture says, the kingdom of God is not about meat. It is about the demonstration of the power of God. So we said that we cannot pretend that the enemy does not exist. Neither can we wish him away. Burying our, head in the sun, in our heads in the sand will not do it. Deciding to just stay our day cannot solve the problem. The devil would always, always leave out his usefulness, which is to kill to steal and to destroy this is um, number 13 in this series and this is the penultimate this today we'll look at the worship on this journey because remember we're in this series the journey we said to, I said today we'll look at the worship and next week we'll round it off by looking at the reward hallelujah so today we'll look at the worship now when you hear worship there's not one person if somebody was in church for just five minutes they know what worship or they have an idea what they think worship is so there is so much ground to cover but there really isn't not much to say because everything that i would say about worship you probably know and you can teach me but i'd like to just bring worship to you number one to recognize that the altar of the journey every journey has an altar and the altar of the journey is um what's the word um is 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 that what fans the embers or what keeps the altar warm and hot nice and hot and effective is worship hallelujah so any believer who does not understand worship in its truest and purest sense may never really be able to find their way on this journey and even if they do it would just be a drag rather than a sprint so worship if i would say just tell you the sermon in one sentence so that we can go i would say that worship is a lifestyle worship is not a song worship is not a dance certainly a song and a dance are components of worship but that's not worship in its entirety hallelujah so worship is not something we are new to in some form or the other what might be the case is that we may never have made the effort to learn and live worship because worship is so commonplace we have worship leaders we have worship teams we have all kinds of things that begin with the name the word worship in church so we tend to think that we know worship enough to be able to give it hallelujah but until you understand worship from every angle and dimension possible you may never really be able to worship god properly so I went to, the, I like the dictionary um, for obvious reasons. When you are not very smart, you go to places where smart people are. The dictionary is filled of content from smart people. So when we go to the dictionary and we come out, we sound smart. So if you didn't know why, go to the dictionary, that's why. The dictionary says that worship is to honor 
or to show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. Some dictionaries will say worship is to show honor or reverence to a deity. Dictionary says that worship is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Another one says worship is declaring the greatness of someone or something. Worship is declaring the greatness of someone or something. However, I have two definitions that are my preferred definition for, this, um, for today's subject matter. It is that worship... Can you turn that down a little? Thank you. It is like worship is a valuing and treasuring of God above all things. Worship is a valuing and treasuring of God above all things. That's part one of my preferred de de definition. The second one says that worship is encountering the presence of God. Worship is an encountering of the presence of God. So worship is a valuing and treasuring of God above all things. Worship is encountering the presence of God. What I know is that we must know the infinite or true worth of God to be able to value and treasure him above all things. Show me a man who struggles in his worship, whether in his expression of worship, in outward things, or in his internal worship. And I will show you a man who has not been able to understand the infinite value and worth of God. The way I say it, and I have said it before here, if you were paying attention, is that no man encounters the true God and is able to stand up straight. There is no man who encounters the God of heaven that is, that is even sane for a moment. That's why I like Jonathan McReynolds' song. He's not the original, but I like his version. When he says, I can only imagine. If I come in the presence of God, will I even be able to speak at all? There is not a man who truly encounters heaven who can ask for a house. There is not a man who truly encounters heaven who can ask for a child. Every time a man truly encounters heaven, he's dumbfounded. He's got smart. He can't, he can't even articulate how he feels in the moment. And so I was looking for a scripture that would not be the usual scriptures about worship. And I found Psalm 40. As I was reading and meditating on Psalm 40 this morning, I was amazed that from the beginning to the end, Psalm 40 tells us about why people come to worship. Psalm 40 tells us about, you know, how a man worship. Psalm 40 tells us about what happens when a man is a worshiper. And Psalm 40 tells us about the reward of worship. Psalm number 40. So I'm going to be looking at the entire Psalm 40. I'll read it first, then I'll break it down as best as I can. Like I said, there's a lot of ground to cover. But wherever we stop will be enough. Psalm number 40, I'm reading from the King James translation. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respected not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. 
If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid my righteousness within my heart. I have, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be blessed, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let as such as thy salvation say continually, the Lord, as let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. Ah! Psalm number 40. As I read and meditated, and I would suggest that you go back and do the same, I saw that worship built, worship is built up from an experience such as the psalmist had, which resulted in his awe and adoration of God and brought him results and re resolve. In verse 1 to 3 of Psalm number 140, the psalmist obviously had a need or a situation for, for, for which he waited on the Lord patiently and cried to him. The Lord's response when he cried was to number one, incline his ear to him, brought him out of the, a horrible pit and, and out of the miry clay. Then he set his feet upon a rock and established his going. We all show up before God because before worship, there is a life. We all show up before God because something is in pursuit of us or we are in pursuit of something. I have never come across a man who just shows up to worship. There is usually something that brings the man in. And for the psalmist, it was a cry that he cried to God. And then God heard him. And God did the things that he did. God always responds. Pay attention. To your cry. By drawing a worship out of you. It's the man who doesn't know God. That cries and expects results in tangible things only. When God responds to your cry, he ought to draw out a response and is a worship out of you. So the first big lesson or the first big idea out of Psalm 140 is that when worship, when we have a proper understanding of grasp of who God is, we are bound to worship him. In verse 3 to 5, the psalmist's encounter and experience with God caused a song to erupt from within him. No one truly sees God and stands up straight. No one truly sees God and does not know to bow. Not only is the psalmist hit by a wave of an outer expression of worship, it opened his eyes to a revelation. 
The man that makes the Lord his trust is blessed. So the first thing that happened when he cried and God responded and set his feet upon a rock and established his going was a song erupted from the inside of him. And everybody around him knew that something had shifted because the Lord has put a new song in his mouth. But after that, he went back in verse number, verse number 3 to 5. He started to see because the Lord opened his eyes and he started to interact with a revelation of God at a realm he had not done before. And his outburst was, oh my God, the man who makes the Lord his trust is a blessed man. That was the first thing he said. Then he said, the man who has no regard for the proud and does not turn aside to liars, he is also a blessed man. Your worship, I'm just explaining it to you. If he ends with a song, you did not see God well. Then the third thing, the third revelation that came with his entry into the place of worship was that he realized quickly that the wondrous work of God are many. And that he saw, he said, his thoughts towards us are numerous and cannot be numbered. Just out of crying out for a bit and God did, he cried once, God did three things. Then a song came out from inside of him. Then scales came off his eyes. And it was like, there's something about this God. If someone can just trust this God, he is blessed. Big idea number two out of Psalm 140. God deserves worship by his very nature and by his actions. God deserves worship by his very nat nature and by his actions. In verses 6 and 7, the psalmist saw, he said a sacrifice is in the essence of why God is good to us. Because even after God did those things for him and he saw God in a light that he had never seen God before, he was clear that God did not make a demand to say, I need you to make a sacrifice now. What he realized was that to delight in him and do his will is weightier than an act of sacrifice before God. So, for those who are looking for how to worship God, this is, here's an idea. To delight in him and do his will is weightier than an act of sacrifice before him. The big idea number three that I drew out of or withdraw out of some, uh, verse 7 and uh, for verse um, 6 and 7 of Psalm 140 is that to delight in him and his will is the greatest sum of worship. To delight in him and his will is the greatest sum of worship. In verse 9 to 10, the psalmist said, he said, when a man has the understanding of what great, how, of what great worship is, here's what happens to that man. He steps out and he tells others. When a man interacts or has an encounter with this God and he realizes the true worth of our God and the value that our God is and the power that our God wields, this man can sit still. They don't need to beg him to evangelize. They don't need to beg him to, do, to, to come out to church. Nobody needs to plead to him. He shows up every time and twice on Sunday. Why? Because he knows the God that he deals with. The man who understands worship, he will not hide God's faithfulness. He will not hide what he has received from God. He does not believe in concealing the way to God from others. He will shout it from the rooftop, the God of heaven, he is my God. Big idea number four, when a man has tasted of God, part of his acts of worship, his act of worship is to do all that he can to get others to experience God at the level at which he, uh, he has. I've seen God do too many things in my life to keep quiet and not tell people about it. It is the reason for my brand of crazy. 
Because I need people to know that this is not theory. I want people to experience him daily the way I experience him daily. I want them to see that God is not only interested when you are dying. God is interested in the color of your shoes if you let him. When you look at verse number 11 to 15, in the place of worship, we can count on his capacity to contend with those who contend with us. So he started from verse 11 and he started to pray. Because he was in worship, he could see the glory. He could feel the impact of God's power. He said, withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed about me. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. As I studied, I realized why people scream and slaughter the devil and nothing happens. Because they haven't put this within the right frame. You frame warfare by worship. So big idea number five is worship is the foundation of victory in warfare. Worship is the foundation of victory in warfare. In verse 16, he says, those who seek God in worship can rejoice and be glad in him. Those who love his salvation will be able to authoritatively worship him. They will be able to say continually, the Lord be magnified. They will not be afraid. Do you know what this means, Ekanem? It means that in season, they will say, the Lord be magnified. Out of season, they will say, the Lord be magnified. In abundance, they will say, the Lord be magnified. In lack, they will say, the Lord be magnified. It really doesn't matter what is happening around them. They never look down. Their head is never bowed. They are always chained up. Because why? They know something you don't know. They they know that by worship they are wrapped around no matter what seems to be falling out they can't fall out do you understand this conversation so the big idea is to seek God is to qualify for worship you cannot qualify for worship if you don't make God your priority seeking him as that psalm will say my uh, oh lord my god early in the morning will i seek you in verse 17 it says the poor and the needy can come to him in worship when they do he will help he will deliver and he will not delay big idea number seven is that it does not take a certain status to qualify for worship and it does not take a certain status to qualify for God's intervention all it takes is a posture so the rich can take this posture and God will show up the poor can take the posture and God will still show up the young can take the posture and God will show up the old can take the posture and God will show up the slave can take the posture and God will show up the free can take the posture and God will show up the educated can take the posture and God will show up the uneducated can take this posture and God will show up doesn't answer to titles 
It doesn't answer to money in the bank. It doesn't answer to beauty. It doesn't answer to whether nothing. By the yardstick of men, if you take a posture of worship, God will show up. Do you see it? Now, of course, you know that you can worship by song. But I, the worship I like the most is the worship that does not require words of any kind. But that's my preference, okay? If Psalm 40 is anything to go by, worship has two elements. The celebratory part of worship, the praise that erupts from within when a man encounters God, the new song that is put in his mouth, the accompaniment of music and dance and all of that is the celebratory part of worship. And then there is a second element of worship, the proclamatory part of worship. The part that you don't, you are not singing, you are not dancing, but you stand and you say, come and see the Lord that I serve. And you begin to point people in the direction where you found him. Does that make sense so far? So, when she, so the proclamation or proclamatory part is the recognition by others that God has done great things for you. In Psalm 126 verse 2 and 3, he ended in verse 3, he says, They will say, the nations will say, the Lord has done great things for them. Pay attention to this. It is not the ones that God did something for that were shouting. It was the ones that were witnesses that were watching. They were the ones that started to proclaim it. They were saying, they said, the Lord, the Lord has done great things for them. When worship is done right, number one, a people who are far or lost are drawn to God. A people who are far or they are lost are drawn to God. There is no way you truly have been touched by the finger of God that people don't want to know what changed. It's not possible. It is not possible. Because God, when a man collides, collides with God, he leaves an indelible mark that would always elicit a question from others. They are bound to ask you, what changed? How did it happen? Where did you go? Who did you see? And then you say, oh, Jesus. <laughs> a people who had lost or drawn to God, will come close when our worship is done right. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24 and 25 in the NLT. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in the, and 24 and 25 in the NLT. It says, but if all of you are prophesying, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed. They will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. What that means, therefore, is if we gather and people cannot see God is in this place. Guys, we need to go back and check our worship. Does this make sense? The point is that true worship of, of God opens access to others to come. Our worship hosts his presence and his presence draws others. When those who come get saved, this is the second, when worship is done right, this is the second point. When those who come, who were far and heard and they come, and they, they, who were far or lost, hear us or see the change in us, and they come and they proclaim that truly God is here in our midst, what happens is they get saved, Yes. And then what happens, the fallout or the ripple effect is more laborers are recruited to go to the fields to bring in the harvest. 
So if we are not harvesting, our worship is not working. <laughs> Father Lord, have mercy. In Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20, Jesus was talking to his disciples about making disciples. And what I find in that scripture is that making disciples is a fallout of a lifestyle of worship. If you think I lie, let's go to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew 28. Let's look at verse 16 to 20. It says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But what preceded this? The 11 disciples, this, after they had been with Jesus, went off to Galilee. Because Jesus told them to go. No man comes to Jesus and finds it convenient to not tell others about Jesus. No man who truly understands the worth and the value. Because remember, that is the worth and understanding of the worth and value of Jesus that incites or elicits the kind of worship that we are talking about. No man knows God like that and does not recognize that others need to know him like that too. No man. In Exodus 33, I found out that worship is something that is domiciled in the presence. Worship is domiciled in the presence. If you look at Exodus 23 from verse 21 to 23. Exodus 20, uh, 33, I beg your pardon. Verse 21 to 23. The Lord continued, look, stand here. Stand near me on this rock. I'm still reading from the NLT. It says, as my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind. But my face will not be seen. What, this, what brought this conversation to be? Moses had asked and said, Lord, show me your ways. Show me your ways. He said, show me your ways. Moses was past uh, the flash and the dash. And then God healed somebody. And then God raised somebody from the dead. Moses was saying, how do you even do these things? How come once you say them, they come to pass? I want to know beyond what is on the outside. Can you bring me into the inner court? And God said to him, my presence will go with you. <laughs> And Moses said, ah, okay, oh, that is the catch. Because what Moses asked was different. What God answered was different. Moses said, you will not tell us who will go with us. May you go with us. God said, my presence will go with you. So Moses said, oh, that is the key to knowing your ways. Okay, not a problem. If your presence does not go with me, we are not going. He said, what he meant was, if your presence goes with Pastor Val, and it's not going with me. We still are not going. If your presence goes with Ekandem. And it's not going with me. We still are not going. Me. I have to know that your presence is going with me. Because there was something that Moses quickly saw. That the power in God is domiciled in his presence. The key to his presence is worship. This morning, I see where I am. I was telling us, I said, I feel starved. And the funny thing is that God was the one that, that ought to be starved, but I was the one that was feeling the starvation. I could feel that I had not given enough worship on that platform in a while. Beyond the 10 minutes, I could see that I haven't stretched myself in that place to bring people to a place of worship. And I was the one that was feeling dry. Go figure what that means. The 
the thing about God's presence is that he is everywhere <laughs> God's presence is beyond the church building the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 19 in addressing the church in Corinth and their lifestyle Paul said help them see that to make worship about a gathering in a place was erroneous God does not dwell in buildings that are built with hands as a matter of fact he said to them he said know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost beyond that we, this is great to join online in great for corporate worship but what I have learned is unless you have a capacity for individual worship corporate worship will never take you where you need to go never so people say that when they miss praise and worship in church sometimes that they don't feel like they went to church and my thinking is that's because at home you do not have a worship altar <laughs> god is omnipresent that's what the bible says he can therefore be worshipped everywhere he can be worshipped in the bathroom he can be worshipped in a bus somewhere he can be worshipped as you drive to and from work he can be worshipped right in the middle of a battle i remember when i was going to have my last child and the devil came to me and said you are going to die surely i just said to announce to you this is the devil talking so i just make i tell you say so this one this is the end you are dead i was like i shall not die i will live and he was laughing I was like, you did, eh. I said, you go die, they laugh. He said to me, he challenged me. He said, go and ask God. Ha. When the devil can look at you and say, go and ask God, you are finished. True, true, I went, guy. That said, I'm going to die. Is it true? He didn't answer. I said, Babu. <laughs> the two of them, they have agreed. I am done. And I kept asking. And he didn't say a word until a day I heard a whisper of the spirit. He said to me, you are so afraid not to die that you haven't opened your Bible in months. He said, open the Bible. So I opened and he said, go to Exodus 25. So I opened to Exodus 25. He said, read it. So I started to read it. By the time I read to verse like 5, I said, eh, this is not what I'm saying. They say I will die. You are saying whether uh, I will cast my young. Who, who cares? They say I'm going to die. You better answer. And he said, you, this is your problem. You're too impatient. Read. I read until I got to, from verse 23 to 25 where he started to say he says he says the hittites the Hivites, the gigashites these people that surround you i will drive them out but i will not drive them out in one day and i said but why can't you drive down he said read now i never finish and i read further and i heard him say he said because if i drive them out in one day the beast of the jungle will overwhelm you what you think will not kill you will end up being the thing that will kill you he says the enemy serves a purpose this is conversation with god he says the ones that surround you that want to kill you they keep the beast away <laughs> and god helped me through that pregnancy and the day we got to the as we got, as i labor kicked in he said to me he said begin to worship me so i started to worship him and I started to worship. And I started to worship. When my husband, you know, we were in the car going to the hospital and he wanted to pray, I said to him, no, we need to worship. So we worshiped till we got to the hospital. And we worshiped through till the baby came out. The moment the baby came out, I heard the Holy Spirit. He said, now you pray. Because, just because I am now talking to you does not mean that the agenda to kill you still doesn't exist. You need to pray now. So, and he told me, he said, pray that the placenta will come out. That otherwise, so I started to say, placenta, in the name of Jesus. This is the manner of when women have children. The placenta comes out. Therefore, I expel you in the name. My husband joined. My midwife joined. And we were praying. It took all of 10 minutes or thereabout before the placenta came. But the point I am making is this. <laughs> the 
there is something that happens in those kinds of places. It's different. So I've been through that. Then exactly, oh my God, that happened in 2002. Exactly 10 years later, in 2012, I had to have another surgery. And we went through it again. And last year, I had another one. The warfare was not the same, but the worship was always deeper. If we go by Moses' ex Moses's example, enab the enabling atmosphere for worship is number one, a hunger for God. A hunger for God. Not a hunger for answers to your prayer. A hunger for God. We need to want God before we need things. Can I say it again? We need to want God before we need things. Or maybe it's because I, I, don't want, I don't want to come to God on a need basis. I want to come to God because I want him. A hunger for God. In Exodus 33 that we just read, in the verse 15, Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. And then in verse 16, he said, how will anyone look favorably on me and your people if you don't go with us? A hunger for God. Moses was more vested in the presence of God. Remember that in this conversation, God had promised him, don't worry, I'll send an angel to go with you. In the Old Covenant, it's not angels that used to show up. But Moses knew that an angel, there is a place that an angel cannot enter. <laughs> he said, guy, I'm not doing angel law. This one I have to do you. I can't do angel." The point I'm making is that eh, worship, again, why is expressed in a song and a dance? Sometimes worship is a stance. Number two, enabling atmosphere for worship is an encounter. An encounter. Jacob said in Genesis 28 verse 16, he said, God is in this place. And I knew it not. But where did he, how did he get there? He got there because he had an encounter. The encounter opened his eyes to what? The presence of God. Can you see that the presence, did I not say it earlier on? So Jacob said, Kai, God is in this place and I did not know it. That changed everything about Jacob going forward. So, the enabling environment for worship is not the best piano that there is. <laughs> it's not the acoustics of the room. It is one, a hunger for God. And two, an encounter with God. Like I said, people who encounter God are always bowing. If God never do you something before, and I go make you stand. If God don't do you something before, this is how you do. The how of worship is not Q, your, Q, uh, is it Q or whatever, your bass guitar. That's not the how of worship. The how of worship is prepare yourself. Take yourself to the place of repentance. Take yourself to the place of apologizing. Let's open to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I will show you something. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'll read it in the King James. Ecclesiastes 5. Da, 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 da. It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Keep thy foot when thou goest. Another translation, more recent translation will say, watch your feet 
when you go into the presence of God. It's saying that you don't do any how when you're coming. There is a preparation required when you come before the presence of God. Do you understand this? Essentially, it's saying be reverent. That's why confession, that's why a purging of sins, that's why repentance is a thing when we come to the place of the presence of God. Do you understand this? It says prepare yourself watch your feet guard your steps when you come into the presence of god be reverent as you come be reverent as you come one thing that i learned because sometimes we don't even know what we're doing one of the things that i learned as worship is that i ha it's rare for a teaching to be going on and you see me get up it's rare that for me is a worship's posture because as far as I'm concerned, God is in the room, he's talking. You are the ones that see a person. I don't see a person talking to me. I see God speaking to me. It is rare for me to get, I don't even have to like the person, but it is rare for me to get up from my seat when worship is going on. It must be, there must be a, a reason for me to get up from my seat when God is talking. For me, it's a worship posture. I know people think, oh, no big deal. That's why one of the key things when people, um, I've said this before, maybe two weeks ago. Let me say it again. Worship, um, um, the choir, especially the instrumentalist, my first conversation with an instrumentalist when he joins me is when the word is going on, sit down. For me, it's, you'll be like, what's that big deal about that? For me, it's huge. It's huge. Because I'm thinking that if your local government chairman came and was talking, will you just get up and go out? For starters, let the, what's that, the um, security man, uh, their security detail are by the door. Once they come in, they shut the doors. Is that not? So you can't go out, you can't come in. It's only in the presence of God that we behave anyhow. I don't do it. It's rare. That's part of my own preparation. Lord, I'm here to hear you. I'm here for an encounter with you. The second way or the second how of worship is to develop a listening ear and heart. To this, this develop a listening ear and, and heart. In the same Ecclesiastes chapter 5 in verse number 2, it says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Like I said, it is hard for you to truly see God and be yapping. Listen. Listen. The third thing or the third how of worship, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, is humility. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. In that verse 2, he says, God is in heaven and you are in the earth. Zip your mouth. Zip your mouth. In the fourth way how of worship is to be careful to mean what you say. Be careful to mean what you say. You see, it talks, you know, it's amazing. In verse 3, it says, For a dream coming through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. That is, if you talk too much in the presence of God, you don't even need someone to ask your address. They already can tell you are a fool. Then verse 4, it looks like he went off on a tangent. Verse 4 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he had no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to curse thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel, it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Be careful. Mean what you say. We... <sighs> It exasperates me. When people want you to remind them of the vow they made to God. Whether the vow is, Lord, I will show up every day in your presence. Whatever it is. 
It offends me no end, and I'm a human being. When people make an agreement with God, then they begin to break it because now it is inconvenient. You don't understand worship. You don't know the value and the worth of God. Because if you did, you dare not. What you say, you've said it. It says when you make a vow, make sure you pay it even when it hurts. That's why the previous verse or the verse before the previous one says, let your words be few. Do not allow the excitement of an encounter make you say something that when you get to you'll not be like, ah, God, did I say that? I was joking. The fifth how of worship. Can you see that <sighs> by the grace of God, we didn't go to your regular worship place today. Fear God. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 7. It says, for in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Fear God. Fear God. In John 4, 19 to 24, I see another template for worship. That worship is beyond an expression. Jesus in this account in John was with the woman at the well of Sychar. And if you paid attention to the entire chapter 4 of the book of John, you will see, as we did in Psalm 40, that worship began with an encounter with the presence and culminated in an act of worship, proclamation, and service. Yet in the middle of all of that, that the woman came and met with Jesus and they had a lot of conversation. And in the end, the woman, woman went back to the village and went to tell them. He says, come and see a man who told me all the things that I had ever done. I, can this not, will, is this not the Messiah? Between there and all, there was this tiny verse that said, God is spirit. <laughs> And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Kai. Automatically, you see that worship is not about a place. That's why you can worship in prison. After all, Paul and Silas worshipped in prison. Worship is not about a kind of people. Anyone. Can worship God and he'd listen. What is, worship is not about acts. But worship. Or our worship must be led. By Holy Spirit. And must conform. To the truth of God's word. If your worship is not led by the spirit. Regard regardless of what your posture is regardless of what sacrifice it and elicits out of you if it is not led by the spirit it is not worship that's number one and if you can worship and it is not aligned with the truth of god's word we need to take another look we are not we are not saying the same thing but there are two things i called worship kryptonite Two things. The first one, wash, everybody knows what kryptonite is, yes? The thing that makes Superman come to his knees. The thing that destroys worship or the capacity to worship in us, number one is when we make worship about us. 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 A while ago, I told them in a choir once upon a time. I said them, I said to them, those your Wamilele song, perish them. Any song that can point me to Jesus, just keep it in your pocket and go and use it in your Christian club when you have the time. Anything that brings it, makes it about me is not quite worship yet. Kryptonite number one. But the biggest kryptonite to worship is familiarity. 
This was how God did it. And that Sunday, then we came. Then as Eunice started, heavens opened. And as Eunice was worshipping, then Temilade took over. So when we come the next Sunday, we want to simulate it. Eunice sing the same exact song. Temilade follow with the same exact song. Ah, in the freaking little bit, should be in the, on the keyboard. Because, no, it's not about us. Familiarity. Is great, is extraordinary kryptonite when it comes to worship. Because here's the point of an encounter. You can never tell how God will manifest in the moment. Or maybe you are, you, you are very wise, you know. But what I know is that I have never been able to bottle God. And thank God they can't bottle him because you and me would not have been able to afford him. So there's nothing like this was how we did it that day and then everybody just fell under the anointing. It's not by your, that thing. There is a preparation we must prepare, yes. But worship, we can't deal with, what we can't be familiar and be able to worship. Even look at it in the human being equation. In human relationships, when we get into the place of human relationship, do you know how that goes that after five years of being married, it just exactly familiarity they say he brings content i used to think it was just between men and men and men and women but i found that even in our worship of god the day you get so familiar that you no longer are in awe of god one prayer i pray for myself and my household religiously and i'm not even a religious person is father may we never lose our sense of awe of you because the day you lose the sense of God's awe, you are finished. Impunity becomes your thing. That's why people will be highlighting adultery and they will say it's grace. Jehovah. Because they are now junior Jesus. Or senior Holy Spirit. So they know now the things that offend God and the things that don't offend God. Because they have become familiar. You can be familiar with the gifts. Because the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What that means is I can preach a storm and be a heretic. And you know the darnest thing? Men will still see Jesus even in that my state. Because it's not about me. Do you get it? And so everyone needs to take another look at their altar and say, ah, why are there so many flies around here? When it's not that you are serving Beelzebub. Why are there so many flies around you? Why does this Bible say that flies only come when it is cold? Once it's hot, flies can perch. Go figure. Do you understand this conversation? On this journey that we are in God, let me now link it to this journey. There is a day that the only thing that works is worship. But beyond that is the fact that God brought us on this journey to worship him. It's not about the warfare and the victories. Those ones. It's not about the diet. We can prove that we can only feed on what God's called us to feed on. It's not about a promise. We can posture and posture ourselves until we receive the promise. It's not about our travel companions. All of those things make the journey. But the real reason why God put us on this journey, he said, Jesus, in, in, in Jesus call them two by two that they might what be with him it was for worship it was for communion it was for koinonia it was for fellowship that god brought us in and that's why the moment we lose our worship there's nothing else we have to offer tell me how many cathedrals do you think god is going to take to heaven tell me how many um 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 plaques and awards do you think god is coming for tell me how many whatever hospitals you built do you think god is coming for the only thing that he's coming from according to the book of revelation is glory that's what he feeds on that's why the bible says he inhabits the praise or the worship of his people it's about the only thing that god wants from you and me 
Tell me how many banks do you think God will, what God wants to build in heaven to store your offering? How many vaults do you think he has to store the gold you are bringing? Absolutely none. When you get there, according to those who said they've been there and come back, I don't know why somebody will go there and come back. If I go, I can't come back for your information. Why would somebody see somewhere where the pavement is gold and want to come back to where there's no night sometimes? Do you understand this conversation? So all these things we think, we bring and we throw around and bring us to the place of arrogance like, I, tell me how many preachers are we going to have in heaven? How many? So you see, this is where it ends. But worship, the Bible says, that with the 24 elders there is a continuous worship going on because that's about all and when we see it we think that oh it's in the song holy 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 that's not just what it is it is in the posture it is in a giving yourself away it is in a laying your life down it is in understanding that this one is too pure to be looked at with my eyes The essence of the journey is so that we might worship. The essence of the journey is so that we might worship. The essence of the journey is so that we might worship. I can't raise a song for you this time. But you might know what it is that you, is in your heart. And you want God to speak to you about. You might know what he has spoken to you even in this time about worship Zinda la magada da du to lubre de kasi kanta yima di zandia. Ji kata libra do to to ye mege de ge de baga sunda yima. Zanta liga libra do sundo ye me de gatika. Father Lord, we just worship you. We just worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We exalt your name, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. Kaze kalima dida tu sandele madede. Your worship. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This living sacrifice. Father Lord, we've come to present ourselves again. To declare, oh God, that we remember that you do not desire sacrifices. We probably would have been able to bring many. Lord, we bring ourselves to this altar. And Lord, we say, receive us, 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 us. We are the song, we are the offering do what you want with us in the name of Jesus Lord that on the day when you call us back to yourself that it will not be hard to get in the flow of what is happening in heaven because that had been our lives here in the earth in the name of Jesus if you are in this room or online and you've not given your life to Jesus. Today is a good day to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Because like I said, worship is not about your songs. 
It's not about your dance. It's about giving up of yourself. Is there someone this morning, who, this evening, who'd like to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Please say it, type it in the comments. We're excited to have you come back to Jesus. And even if you're returning, if you notice that you have straight and you have made your worship about everything else but him, then it is time to return. You can return to and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life again. I give you my life again. Father Lord, we are asking that this word will not stand against us. We pray, oh God, that every day, every moment, every hour, that we will be able to say that our lives are your own, that we belong to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we worship your name. Yes, we give you praise, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We see this living.